Good morning. My name is Joanna Courtright. We are going to begin right away because we're already a bit into the hour, but it's my pleasure to give a short introduction to Richard Norris. Many of you heard his session yesterday on the no knife approach. Today he's going to be working with the concepts and principles of a comprehensive exercise program specifically for musicians. Um, rather than even going through the lengthy introduction, I just would like you to know that he's clinical assistant professor at Boston University School of Medicine, board certified in physical medicine and rehabilitation, but he is also a dancer and has many years of yoga and tai chi behind him. So with these credentials, I think you'll have a good, I hope, as near hour as you possibly thank you. can. So thank you, Richard. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, I would like to encourage, if anyone wants to follow along, there's some room in the back. People were following along in the back yesterday, so that's fine if you want to participate. Um, I would just like to say what we're going to be doing here is um, an exercise program specifically designed for musicians, and this is something that I developed uh, for use at the New England Conservatory of Music, where I'm on the faculty and teach a course in health education for musicians. My feeling about a health education program for musicians is, first of all, it should, be able, it should be something that can be done on the road in a hotel room or a dormitory room or a small apartment because if you're relying on exercise bike or Nordic track or equipment or swimming pools, as soon as you go on the road or traveling, your exercise program goes down the tubes. So this will cover both warm-up, stretching, some strengthening, uh, if we have time, a little bit of aer aerobic movement, non-impact aerobics, which I think is very important, and also um, some instrument-specific exercises. In other words, if you play this instrument, what additional exercises do you need to do to correct some of the strength and uh, muscle tightness and balances that may develop as a result of playing, playing your instrument? Also, uh, a Apropos to what was said today on the insurance panel and how distressed uh, some people were over the fact that it was hard to get professional musicians to do exercises, I think that the uh, best thing to do is to try to get students to get, get this instilled in the conservatory curriculum and to try to get students to develop good exercise habits and patterns. The easier you um, develop good exercise, the earlier you develop good exercise habits, the more likelihood it is that one will continue as one reaches adulthood into professional musicianship. So without further ado, um, we're going to begin. I'd like to start off by saying that stretching is not a warm-up, although many people um, inappropriately think it is. Muscles, muscle tissue is elastic, and in order to stretch it, you need to warm it up properly first. So I'm going to start with a warm-up basically derived from Tai Chi that I've studied and from there go into stretching and then strengthening and then the other parts. Again, if anyone likes to, please feel free to follow along in, in the back of the room. So the first thing I'm going to do is um, some of these Tai Chi, they're like breathing exercises, and I'll comment as I go along. The knees are approximately shoulder width apart, the feet are shoulder width apart, and as I go down, the knees are going to stay directly over the toes. Okay, that way you avoid knee strain and knee injury. My spine and back is kept straight, and as I go up, my arms reach the top at when my knees are fully extended, and my arms reach the bottom as I come to the bottom of my knee bend. So there's sort of a coordinated rhythm between the arms and the body. And I'll breathe in when I go up, and breathe out when I go down. Also notice that at this point, my hands are facing palm down, but as they cross, the hands turn palm outward and then float down very gently as if you're doing this through water. You can rise up onto the toes if you like at this point and settle down here. There are several of these, so I'll go right from this one into the next one. This time, as I go down, I'm just going to let my arms go down. They overcross slightly. And as they come up, I'm going to go down. So this is the opposite of the one we just did. The arms go up and the body goes down. And again, breathe out. Breathe in. The hands are very relaxed. Hands and arms are very relaxed in this. Do it from the side so you can. OK. Now at the top of my stroke here, I'm going to let my arms settle down to a bent elbow position like this and push straight out to the side. 
Breathe out. Breathe in. Now notice Tai Chi, you know, if you've ever seen the yin-yang symbol of the active and the passive or the opposites, this is really incorporated in here. At this pushing out phase, the extensor muscles of the forearm are contracted so that the hands are up and you have the feeling against pushing out against subtle resistance like water. And at this point, there's a transition where the hands and wrists relax and they come back, they float back more in a passive mode. So this would be the yin and this would be the yang. And we'll see this again in other ones that we do. Now we're going to modify this one a little bit. And now I'm just going to do one hand. I'm going to push my body away. And as the hand comes back, it pulls it in. Pushes it away and pulls it in. Breathe in. Breathe out. And again, this is the active phase. My, my uh, wrist is up and the feeling of strength. And here is relaxation. So contraction, relaxation. Now do it on the other side. Okay. Now, as a challenge to those of you who like coordination challenges, you can do it simultaneously where you're pushing away here, then push away here, push away here. Don't think about it. Don't try to think about it. Just do it. It's like the centipede who got all confused walking, trying to figure out which leg came first, you know. It's a very natural reciprocal motion. And again, the hand relaxes on the upstroke, and it's contracted on the extension. OK. The next one we're going to do, I think, is very good for uh, fiddlers and the bowing arm. Uh, because it really has that paintbrush effect. And again, feet shoulder width apart. I'm just going to let my arm swing across my body. First the shoulder closes, then the elbow, then the hand and wrist. Then I rotate my body, shoulder opens, elbow opens, hand and wrist opens. And bring it across. Let it come close to your chest as it passes this way. Opens, and again sweeps. And again, you have the feeling of here that you're pushing through water. There's some subtle resistance. And then you close. So this would be the yang or the active phase. And this is a relaxed or passive phase. Okay? Show that from the side. And of course, there's a weight shift that's involved in this also. I'm shifting my weight from one knee bends and the other knee extends. And it's the knee that bends is the one where, where on the side that the arm is. So when the arm is on this side, this knee is bent. When the arm is on this side, that knee is bent. So you breathe out. Breathe in. Breathe out. And in. And do it the other side. Now, guess what comes next? <laughs> Very smooth and coordinated. OK. Now, the next one that we're going to do uh, requires a stance that's like a martial arts stance. One foot straight forward and the other foot more or less at a 45 or a 90 degree angle. And again, the weight shift is going to be forward and back. But notice that the torso stays vertical. I'm not leaning forward and back like that, but simply shifting my weight forward and back. Okay. The left arm starts across the body like this and makes a big, broad sweep out. And at the end, it turns over and floats down. Notice that my body rotates forward and side, forward and side. And when it's turned to the side, it lets the arm swing past it. Gravity makes it come up to here, and then you just open up again. A little lilt at the end, and it comes down, almost like a, a conductor preparing Giving a preparation. OK, right hand starts off with the elbow bent and the hand up like this, and pushes straight out with the chest straight forward. And again, same thing. Turns over, palm up, and just swings down in a straight arc. And gravity lets it come up and around, bend the elbow again, and then push straight out.
Okay. And combining the two, the hands face each other like you're holding a, a little ball. So they push out, come down. Breathe in. And you would also do it to the other side. You can do it this way to show. So that your hands get a chance to do the opposite motions. Again, notice the weight shift forward and back as I'm doing that. Okay? The next one, again, same stance. You're going to do a forward and back weight shift, but this time you pretend that you're standing chest deep in water and your arms are floating on the top of the water and you're skimming the water like this. It should have a very light, floaty feeling as if it's the water that's supporting your arms. Also notice that the closing of the arms is accomplished by um, moving the trunk forward. I'm already coming forward even as my arms are completing the backstroke. And as my arms come forward, I'm already moving my body backwards. You do it from the side. A variation on this is done with the open hands. I'm going to switch stance just for variety here. And this time you can feel like you're gathering in energy and pushing it out. Gathering in, pushing out. Breathe out. Okay. And the last one we're going to do is like an opening and a closing exercise. This one we're going to be stepping open and then stepping closed. Stepping open and stepping closed. And it goes like this. Very good for deep breathing. Do it from the side. Notice that the hands are palm out. And they just come in an in a, um, easy arc. You're not forcing your shoulders back. And at this point, your arms are just hanging. You're in a sort of squatting position. The head relaxed back. I'm not forcing it back. And then to breathe out, I s close my feet. The arms come, and I'm just hanging here. OK, I'm warmed up, so we can go on to the stretching now. Remember I said you need to warm up, get the body warm before doing the stretching. I'm going to start, in order to make it simple and easy for me to remember, I start with the neck and work all the way down to the heel cords and calf muscles. That way it's easy to remember. It's kind of a systematic way to do it. I'm going to start with just simple neck rolls. And again, I want to say, I didn't say this at the beginning, but this exercise program is really for uninjured people who want to do this. If you have a specific injury, you need to check with your doctor or your therapist to modify this plan for your specific needs. But this exercise program is designed for uninjured people and to prevent injuries. So neck rolls, nice and slow. My knees are soft and my hips are soft. They're not locked. You can do this at your own speed. Do it first in one direction and then the other. And do it from the side. OK. Now I'm going to do rotation of the neck. Just moving it as far as it goes comfortably, holding it for five or 10 seconds, and going to the other side. If you like, you can do sort of a little nodding at the end of the range there. Just taking it through the full range of motion. Okay. Lateral flexion to the side. Now, the thing you want to be careful about here is not letting this shoulder hike up in the air. You can either hold on to your trousers or whatever, or if you're sitting down when you do this, you can hold on to the side of a chair. That will prevent that shoulder from hiking up. Okay? So lateral flexion first to one side and then to the other. Again, holding these about 
10, 15 seconds, no bouncing, it's a steady stretch. Okay, you can also do it in the front for the front of the neck muscles. Okay, um, sort of more advanced if you want to do that is straight forward and straight back. Some of these exercises come right out of jazz dancing and jazz isolation. If you really want to try a challenge, you try side to side <laughs> or, or little circles, you know, like your little... We used to do that all the time in jazz class. Okay, let's move on to the shoulders. Shoulder shrugs. Bring all the way up, bring your shoulders back, down as far as they go, then letting them roll in slightly, up, back and out, and down around. Okay, knees and hips relax. Don't lock the knees out straight. You can breathe in as you go up. You can also do this with your arms up in the air like this. Do it forward and backwards. Or you can do one arm at a time. Okay. Chest stretching. Stretching for the pectoral muscles. These muscles are often tight, particularly in people that work with their arms always in front or crossed over their body. Cello. Uh, often piano, and these muscles will make it very hard to stand up straight if they're tight. So chest pectoral stretching, we're just going to breathe in and just go. This can be combined with stretching the muscles between the shoulder blades, the rhomboid muscles, by going from this position to this position. This is right out of modern dance. And basically what I'm doing here is making a, like hugging a beach ball. I'm making my arms rounded not out straight like this, not crunched in like that. My palms are facing outwards, and I'm feeling like someone is pushing right against my breastbone and pulling out of my hands at the same time. My chin is down, my knees are bent, and I'm in a pelvic tilt, so my pelvis is tipped that way. Okay? And you can alternate that with... Now, if you want to get a little bit more of a stretch on there, you can reach forward with one arm while reaching back with the hip on the same side. So you would do a stretch like that. And that gives a little bit more of a stretch there. Okay. You can also do that as sort of a non-impact aerobic exercise by opening and closing. You could do... or lots of variations on the theme. Here. You can try that from the side. Or another one would be from this position coming to this position where you're really extending your back and neck and digging out again here. Okay. Now from this position, it's nice to do sort of a rippling exercise for the spine, almost like snapping a whip. And it would go something like this. Again, I'm going to start with my head back, lead with my chest, and as my hips close, I'm going to reverse, let my head sink, and roll up. As my head comes back, I'm already leading forward with my chest. From here, you can go right into your back bend. Now, the back bend should be done with the hands right at the junction of the buttocks and the top of the thighs for support. The head goes back first, and then the back arches. My knees are slightly relaxed, 
and I'm supporting with my hands so that I don't overstretch my back. And then you can come out of it by going into that rippling one. Now at any point you can go back to something you've previously done just to kind of loosen up. Okay? Side stretching for the muscles under the arm. And again, this is very important for people who play their instruments all the time with the arms down. Okay? Unlike the violinist or the classical guitarist, if you're playing the clarinet or the oboe or the horn, unless you're doing Mahler where your horn is up in the air over your head, your arms are down by your side most of the time. So we're going to stretch the latissimus muscles, the abdominal oblique muscles on the side. Okay? Now there are three levels of doing this. The easiest and safest way is to start off with your hand on the side of your thigh like this for support. I'll do it on this side. And leaning over like this, keeping the arm out here. The head is in a relaxed position. You don't have to hold it up like that. You can just kind of let it relax. And I'm controlling with my left arm here how much stretch is put on my side. Do it to both sides. And if you look, um, I'm, I'm flat. If I were against a wall, everything would be lined up against the wall. I'm not forward like this. My arm is directly over my body. Okay? The next hardest level of stretch would be to take away that support. So it would be something like this. This is right out of ballet class. You go. And harder still is to use two hands out to the side. Don't try to do it unless you think you're able to. You would want to build up to this progressively. Don't start off with the most difficult if you're not used to doing it. OK. Uh, going on, we're working on stretching the spine of the chest now. The same way we did rotation of the head, let's do rotation of the spine. Um, here again, the feet are shoulder width apart. And as I rotate, the important thing is that to the side that I'm rotating, I'm going to release that foot and let it turn out a little bit so you don't strain the knee on that side. Okay? This can be done either, we'll do it this way. This can be done either with the hands on the hips looking in the same direction. The hands can be out this way, or they can be locked together using the backward hand to pull the forward hand a little bit to get an extra stretch. and relax and shake it out. You can stop frequently during, during your stretches just to kind of do jiggling and relaxing and stuff. Also, now we've stretched the spine this way, this way. We've done forward and back. Let's do just a little bit of hanging just to stretch the back muscles passively and let them relax. Knees are bent, hips are slightly bent, and I'm just hanging. My arms are just hanging. You can Drop one arm, drop the other arm to get a little rotation in the back while you do this. Okay, you can also do a side to side like we did with the head. You can do a side to side motion with the chest. And again, there's not much motion from the hips down on this. It's pretty much a, an isolation of the chest. Again, going side to side. If you look at it from the side, again, okay? You can combine it with a forward and a back motion and put them together and make circles. Okay, so you're getting the bones to move in all the different ways that they can in a natural way because you're doing it with your own muscular effort. Okay, um, I think we've pretty much covered uh, chest and back and all of that as far as stretching goes. Let's quickly do some lower extremity stuff. After all, if you're a soloist and playing out there, you don't want to be very rigid in your hips and knees and stand there and play like that. You want to have some flexibility, so the Tai Chi stuff is very good for it. And the stretching is too. Big hip circles. My knees are straight. The motion is just happening at the ankles and the hips. Notice that when my hips are forward, I'm back. 
when my hips are back, I'm forward. Same thing from side and to side. So you're always in balance. This is a very relaxed, easy. Okay. And then we do small hip circles, which is, again, right out of jazz dancing. It's a jazz isolation. It's like doing this pelvic tilt forward and back. Let's do it from the side. Forward. And sometimes if you actually put your hands there like that and help to move the pelvis, it helps you get in touch with these movements. I keep it on the side like this. Uh, when I teach this in my class at NEC, there's always a little bit of uh, embarrassed giggling amongst the co-ed students, but I just tell them there'll be murder on the dance floor if they can get this one down and <laughs> kind of breaks the ice. And actually, Latin dancing does use a lot of the, you know, the pelvic motion in it. This is also very good for loosening up the low back. Okay, Hamstring stretches. Hamstring stretching is a very important part of a low back program, which we'll go over specifically. Uh, maybe we'll do that next. Because when you bend forward, there's something called lumbo-pelvic rhythm. In other words, your lumbar spine flexes, but your pelvis also rotates as that happens. Since the hamstrings come from the sitting bones, if they're tight, when you go to bend forward, all the bending happens in your low back because now the pelvis isn't free to rotate. So a very important part of preventing low back pain is flexibility of the hamstrings. If they're tight, again, you can use your arms for support and kind of walk your way down the legs. The head and upper body should just be relaxed. Knees need to be straight but not jammed back on this one. And you could just kind of work your way down little by little. If you like, you can put some phone books or something or a low stool here to rest, to rest on where you can just simply hang. You don't want to bounce, but little pulses are okay. The reason you don't want to bounce is because muscles have a built-in protective mechanism called a stretch mechanism, where if a sudden stretch is put on them to protect themselves from tearing, they automatically contract very vigorously. So you, that's why you don't want to bounce when you do this. And when you come up, bend the knees, do your pelvic tilt, and roll up slowly, the head coming up last. That way you avoid strain on the back. You may, after doing this, want to again do your back bend. And again, briefly repeat any of the other ones that you've already done. Just kind of as a review and loosening up. Okay. Um, Quadricep stretching on the other side of the hamstrings are the quads. This, uh, these are very easily stretched. You can either hold on to the wall, or if you want a balance challenge, you can do it without holding on to the wall. And you want to uh, both bend your knee, but if you want more of a stretch, you need to bring the knee slightly behind the level of the hips while maintaining upright. You don't want to lean forward. You lose the stretch. But bringing this back like this, and just hold it for a few seconds and relax, shake it out, do the other side. You can also do this lying down if you want to. You can do it lying on your side. Again, you want to make sure the knee is, is brought behind the body when you do that. Okay. And very briefly, calf muscle stretching can be done against the wall. Both feet, notice, are pointing straight forward. Okay. One foot forward, one foot back. The important thing here is to start off with your heel on the ground. You don't want to put it so far back that you can't get the heel down. Move it far enough so you start off with the heel down and you get your stretch by sliding that front foot a little bit far further forward and bending your elbows and the front knee, keeping the back knee straight. And switch. You also want to make sure when you do it that the front knee stays pretty much over your toe. Don't put that foot so far back that when you're doing it, the front knee is way over the toe. It puts too much strain on the knee for doing that. So as you do it, the knee should be pretty much uh, directly over the toe. Okay, so that pretty much completes the stretching. One other one I do want to show you for the pectoral muscles uh, that's very good that you can use a corner of a wall for if you can find a free corner. I don't know. I can't find one in my apartment. I don't know if you have one in yours. Everything seems to be filled with furniture. But by putting your hands up here, again, one foot forward, one foot back, and leaning in slowly into the corner, 
you can get a good stretch for those muscles. You can also do it with your hands at different heights for a good stretch. Okay, let's talk about a low back program. Low back certainly is, low back pain is certainly not limited to musicians. But uh, some instrumentalists, I think, are more susceptible to it than others, or more prone to it because of the stresses of their instruments. Cello, certainly, they don't have the benefit of using the backrest, nor do piano players. I think guitarists, classical guitarists also, because of the position and the constraints of seating, are prone to low back pain. So what would a low back program, a preventative low back program, consist of? Well, we've already done the pelvic isolations, back bends, hamstring stretching, but there are a couple of others that we can add to it. I'm just going to open this up here for a moment. These are done on the floor, and uh, first of all are aimed at stretching the, uh, stretching the low back. You simply bring one knee up to the chest and hold it for a few moments. If you have knee problems or knee strain, you can hold it from underneath the knee so that you're not compressing the knee. And then do the opposite. And then when you work up to it, you can do both knees and do a little rock and roll. Okay, that helps to stretch, to stretch the low back. Another good stretching exercise for the low back is what they call the cat and the camel. This being the camel, and that being the cat. And you're basically, again, to get flexibility into the low back. You can also modify this into uh, this kind of exercise. And reverse. OK. Strengthening the low back can be done at the same time as strengthening the hamstrings and the upper back all simultaneously. This can be done by lying on your stomach and arching up from this point here like this. If your knees are bent and your elbows are bent, it's easier. Okay, You come back. If you do it with everything outstretched, it's a little bit harder. Also strengthens the back of the neck muscles and the muscles in between the shoulder blades. Hold it about four or five seconds, and then release. If you want to modify it, you can just do the chest, or just do the one leg at a time separately, depending on what level you're starting out at. Okay. One more like that is lifting one leg to the side, I mean one leg out to the back, and bringing it in with a contraction, trying to touch your head to the knee, and then arching up again. Okay, and then repeat it on the other side. Okay. Um, one more thing, abdominal strengthening is the last component of a good low back program. If you have trouble doing even one sit-up, you might want to start off uh, with a bolster or a wedge so that you're already starting partway sitting up. If you're able to do it from the floor, you should remember that your knees need to be bent because if you do a sit-up with straight knees, you're primarily using your hip flexor muscles, not your abdominals. This kind of weakens the hip flexor muscles by shortening them, and then you can do your sit-up. The easiest way to do it is with the arms in front of the body tucking the chin first and rolling up. You don't have to come all the way up. Not necessary. A little bit more difficult would be to cross the arms over the chest. Again, tucking the chin first and the head goes back last. Comes up first and goes down last. Even harder if you want more resistance, hands behind the head or if you want to do the tougher version, put them behind your head. Okay? So that's the low back program. Now, the next component, again, because I think that a musician's program needs to have several components, just like a balanced diet has, you know, the three major food groups or four major food groups, 
Uh, somebody said, I think they're caffeine, nicotine, <laughs> carbohydrates, and preservatives. Right. Um, just, as, just as you have a balanced diet, you want to have a balanced exercise program where you have stretching, warm-up, strengthening, and cardiovascular, and the other things as well. The best time to do the exercise program, I think, is the first thing in the morning after taking a hot shower, when the muscles are, are relaxed. Um, then later on, if you want to do a warm-up before, and you should do a warm-up before playing your instrument, you can do an abbreviated version because you've already done a good warm-up. But remember, people can injure their backs lifting up the garbage to take out the garbage or any, you know, tying their shoelaces. So I think it's a good idea to start off the day limbering up. It's like starting off the day putting on comfortable clothes instead of tight, uncomfortable clothes. Anyway, a strengthening program, we're going to talk about um, two or three basic ways to do it. One is using your own body's resistance. Um, first of all, you can just simply flex your muscles. You know, it just feels good to do that. St you straighten your arms, roll them in and out, you know, make a muscle, contract your forearm muscles, make your muscles tight here. You can reach across your body to tighten the chest muscles. Okay? So you can actually, as you're doing your stretching, try to bring your shoulder blades back together to strengthen the muscles between them. Just contract your muscles. That will you know, have some strengthening benefit. You can also um, use resistance of one muscle group against the other. So for example, in doing something like this, I'm using the biceps on this side and the triceps on this side. Then I would switch. If this is uncomfortable, you can put a little sponge or a little folded washcloth between, between the wrists. Okay? Don't do it as hard as you possibly can. You know, do it half as hard as you can and gradually build up to it. If you want to do the muscles under the arms, you can simply press against the side of your hips. Okay? Don't worry, you won't crush your pelvis. I don't think anyone's quite that strong. Um, to do the shoulder muscles, you can sit down and press out against your knees. That not only strengthens the shoulder muscles, but the inner thigh muscles. Okay? For the trapezius muscles, you can pull up on the underside of your thighs. That will strengthen the muscles and work the muscles there. So there's a lot that can be done without uh, the use of weights and equipments and things like that. One of the things that I would like to talk about that I think is very useful for musicians and that I include in my class is the use of TheraBand. And you can um, get ordering information or get this from any physical therapist or most occupational therapists know where, where to order it. And I think it's very useful because it's inexpensive, folds up, stick it in your gig bag, and you can take it with you wherever you go. Um, exercises that can be done with this, for example, if you want to do biceps strengthening, just simply like this. And remember, the, the shorter you, uh, the TheraBand is, the more tension. So this is a lot more resistance than this. So you can grade uh, according to, to your needs. Okay, do it on both sides. For triceps, for example, you can simply hold it behind your back and do it like this. And again, you would want to open it up so that it's over your fist, like that, because that's the most comfortable way to do it, so that the pressure is not concentrated and not constricting. Okay. If you have a little beam, you can tie this to, put it overhead. You can do pull down, straight pull down exercises like this for the latissimus underneath, or else tie it around some kind of a hook or a pole, or get a tall friend to hold it for you. Okay. Um, other exercises that are important that you can do with this for the shoulder muscles or the deltoids. You can do the one that we just showed before. Just kind of shorten up on it. Okay. For the underarm muscles, again, you'd need to, to hook it around something. Perhaps I can use this. I don't think I'm in any danger of causing the piano to go flying across the room by pulling on it. Um, but for example, the underarm muscles. You can also do the pectoral muscles. By bringing it across the body. Okay, again, you'd want to open this up so it's comfortable. And my fist is very loose. I'm not making a tight, hard fist when I'm doing this. Internal and external rotation for the rotator cuff muscles of the shoulder. Particularly important for those instruments that really uh, demand a lot out of the shoulder, like the bowing arm, 
or even the left arm of the fiddle, the guitarist, and the like. For this exercise, you want to make sure that your elbow is bent at a 90 degree angle and that it's tucked in close, held in close against your side. You start with the arm in external rotation and you bring it across the body. This is different from the pectoral muscle where we were doing like this. Here the elbow is at 90 and you're simply doing a rotational thing. To strengthen, that's for the internal rotators, the subscapularis muscle. Incidentally, that's the only muscle that crosses the front of the shoulder joint. So if people have problems with the shoulder slipping in and out of socket, subluxation, this can help to strengthen that and perhaps stabilize the shoulder. To do the opposite muscles, the external rotators, for the sake of demonstration, I'll do it on this hand. Again, elbow at 90 degrees held against the side, but this time I'm starting with my hand across my body and I'm opening it up like this. If you want to wrap the TheraBand around a piece of a broomstick or something like that to, to uh, make a better grip, one can do that. Okay? You can also strengthen the trapezius muscles at the base of the shoulder, which are so important in the thoracic outlet syndrome where the uh, blood vessels get compressed from sort of a droopy shoulder girdle. You want to strengthen the muscles that hold up the shoulder girdle. You can hold one end in each hand and just stand on it and do your shoulder shrugs that way. Okay? The closer your grip is, the more resistance. Okay. Um, also, the people who make TheraBand do make little handles if you want to go that route. And, and carry it with you that way. Sometimes for certain exercises it makes it a little easier to do, but it's not absolutely necessary to use it that way. Okay, we've talked about strengthening. Um, I just want to briefly mention non-impact, the concept of non-impact aerobics, um, which is ways to do cardiovascular exercise without jumping up and down, which can be strainful on the joints. And also my philosophy for a musician's program is that um, you should be able to do it at 2 o'clock in the morning after a concert without disturbing your neighbors. So basically it has to do with things like movements of the arms and legs. You can do based on like little dance movements. Okay? And again, it's quiet. There's no pounding, impacting, walking forward, back. So you can just make up your own or else there's a very good tape by Debbie and Carlos Rosa produced by Vestron which is in Stanford, Connecticut that has a whole hour program of this non-impact aerobics. The last thing I briefly want to talk about is instrument specific exercises and that would be in addition to the general program that we've just gone over. Some brief examples, um, if you play the violin or viola, your left arm is externally rotated, the right arm is internally rotated much of the time. So if that's all you do all day long, um, you can develop tightness in the back of the left shoulder and tightness in the front of the right shoulder. And, you know, you see people walking down the street like that, you say, oh, you play violin. They say, how'd you know? You know um, so you can simply do, we didn't cover this, but shoulder stretching exercises. And this is not the rotation. The chest is, is staying straight forward, but just simply grabbing my elbow in each hand to stretch the posterior deltoid muscles, the back of the shoulder. Okay? So for the violinist, you would particularly want to do that in the left arm. For the right arm, you'd want to work on that exercise, the stretching the pectorals. We already mentioned the cellists who often sit rounded. They need to do specifically that back program we went over and also stretching the pectoral muscles and also stretching the forearm flexor muscles, which often get tight, particularly in instruments that take more force to play than others. That can be easily done. I like to do it by supporting the hand against the wall and sliding it up little by little and also straightening the elbow as I do it. Okay? Also for um, violin and viola and guitar, you want to stretch the muscles on the back of the left forearm because of the playing in this position puts that, those extensor muscles under a lot of tension and under a lot of stretch. If they're tight, they're going to be more prone to injury. So by making a loose fist and bringing it down, 
making a loose fist, bringing it down with the elbow straight because those muscles cross the elbow joint. And if you like, giving a little gentle assistance with the other hand. Don't stretch to the point of pain, only to the point of discomfort. Hold it steady, 15, 20 seconds, relax, shake it out. Again, the muscles should be warm before doing this. Okay? Classical guitar. We already mentioned the left hand of the guitar, um, but if you're sitting with the foot up on a stool like this, you can develop short and tight hip flexors on that one side. So again, you'd want to do those exercises where you're bringing your leg back behind you to stretch the hip flexors. Okay, don't let that leg come out like that. It stays in close to the other side. So you don't want it out to the side. Okay? Also for guitar or horn, or other instruments where your arm is consistently held more or less at the same angle. You can take advantage of isometrics. Isometrics tend to strengthen muscles specifically at the angle that you do the isometric. And by isometric, I mean no movement happening, either against a wall or by holding it and giving resistance. So if your arm is usually held at pretty much the same angle, you can do isometrics at that angle for specific strengthening. Okay? Flute, in which I'm a practitioner, um, the left arm is across the body, the right shoulder is often held back, the head is rotated, or if the flute is dropped down, it's rotated and tilted. They need to do exercises to stretch the muscles on the right side of the neck, again, those lateral and rotational exercises to strengthen, the, to stretch those. And also, since the left arm is across, the opposite of the violin, they want to stretch the muscles in the front here and in the back here almost the opposite that we were looking at for violin and viola. Double bass is often a problem. They're sitting with one leg up, one leg down, often reaching down. So they would want to do rotational back exercises to the other side. Also, since this arm is up in the air a lot and this one's down, they may want to work on the stretching exercises that do the opposite kind of motion. The harp, um, uh, similarly, you know with the harp, uh, the left hand operates the bass strings and the right hand the treble. So they're always reaching forward this way. So the harpist would want to strengthen the anterior deltoids, particularly on the left arm. You can do the isometrics at that angle. And also, since the back is always rotated to the left, they would want to work on rotational exercises to the right or to the left, to this, to this side, OK? Um, Clarinet and oboe, uh, for example, since they're down, again, you want to work on stretching the underarm like that and the chest muscles, things like that. Um, so th that gives you an idea of what I mean by instrument-specific exercises in addition to the general program be uh, because many of the instruments are played in an asymmetrical and unbalanced fashion. Um, at this point, I I'll open up the floor. If there are any questions, we'll take any questions. We have about uh, 10 minutes, 5, 10 minutes. Yeah. For piano. Again, I think for a piano, um, you, ha you have this problem, and you do it from the side. When you sit on a flat surface like this, the weight of your torso is actually behind the weight of your, behind the point of your sit bones. So gravity wants to do this. Okay, and all of us have seen people play the piano like this. In order to sit up straight, you have to work your hip flexors, abdominals, and back muscles. So they need to particularly work on those muscles. And also hamstring flexibility. If you're sitting away from the piano and reaching out for the pedals, if your hamstrings are tight, it'll pull you into this posterior pelvic, pull you into this posterior pelvic tilt and make it harder to sit up straight. Organists, by the way, have an even worse problem. If they're playing on the upper manuals, it really tends to force the back backwards. One thing that you can do for the piano and the cello is to use a forward sloping seat, which brings your body weight directly over your sitting bones so that you don't have that same tendency to slump. It's easier to sit up straight. And I've given out those sheets on seating problems of musicians uh, that has information on where to obtain uh, the little portable uh, foam wedge cushion that can do that. Yeah. Well, it's a controlled, it's a controlled motion. So, right, you don't just let it fly. As I push out here, I'm letting gravity, I'm, I'm relaxing the arm so the gravity can swing it up and around, but I'm not just letting it collapse like that. It's a controlled. Okay. It's a controlled descent, and it comes around. But I'm not just completely letting it go and letting it fall. Yeah. 
Yes, to a certain extent it certainly does. And that's why I think it's a good idea to do it the first thing in the morning after your shower or whatever so that your body is warm. If you go out into the cold, obviously one thing is to bundle up and make sure you stay warm. But when you get to wherever you're going, try to get there a few minutes earlier. And I think this is a good idea in general for musicians. Try to get to your gig or your orchestra rehearsal a few minutes early so that you can run through at least some of the stretching and warm-up exercises, if not the whole program. And if you've done it once already in the morning, you can do an abbreviated version. You do have some carryover and some benefit. Certainly the longer period of time between doing it, the less carryover. If you do it in the morning and your gig is at 8 o'clock at night, um, there's not as much carryover as if you've done it three or four hours earlier. When a muscle is injured, for example, with tendonitis or a muscle tendon injury or a pulled muscle in the neck or whiplash or anything like that, when a muscle is injured, um, its natural tendency is to contract. That's called muscle spasm, and the purpose of that is to splint and immobilize and protect the injured area. Unfortunately, it becomes a vicious cycle where when a muscle is continually contracting, it then becomes itself a source of pain because it's not relaxing and contracting, it's constantly tight. So it is important in injuries to restore the proper length, the, the normal resting length of the muscle. The way to do that when you have an injury um, is to first put on heat and then do some massage. The heat and the massage have the, have the purpose of loosening and softening the collagen and relaxing the muscle. Then once the muscle is, is warmed and softened and kneaded and massaged, then you can do your stretching and you must uh, stretch only to the point of mild discomfort. If you don't have an injury, you can stretch to the point of sort of discomfort bordering on pain if you don't have an injury. But if you do have an injury, you have to only stretch to the point of mild discomfort so as to not further aggravate the injury. It's kind of like walking a tightrope. You have to stretch the muscle to restore the normal length, but you don't want to overstretch it to cause more irritation and aggravation. So you have to be very sensitive and sort of listen to your muscles and don't go any uh, further beyond mild discomfort. Yeah. Well, what I just demonstrated took, took about an hour. Now, because you can... There's a sense of, see, if I do that, there's a sense of being breathless between things. You're, you're doing a demonstration. If you add the time... Sure. Well, let me just explain. When I teach this at, at the conservatory, we will spend three weeks just on the stretching part, three weeks just on the Tai Chi part, three weeks just on the strengthening part, two or three weeks on you know, aerobic and stuff like that. So what I think you can do is the concept of cross-training like athlete. So one day you might do as you work out just the stretching part. One day you might just do the strengthening part and just do a very brief stretching before you do it. So I'm not suggesting that you have to do the whole thing at once. The nice thing about this program is that it gives you all the different components. You make your own personalized. It's like a buffet. You go and you pick what you like from it and what feels right for you because my hope is to present all this information but that you will pick and choose what feels good and what feels right for you so that it will become an ongoing part of your daily life and your daily activity to do regular exercise, not necessarily to do everything that I've demonstrated. Okay. Yeah. T h e r a b a n d. E R A B A N D, therapeutic band, Theraband. Any other questions about the exercise program? Okay, thank you all very much. Hope you enjoyed it. Thank you.